Today we're going to talk about race. Oh, no, 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 no. When we say race, what we really mean is species, in the sense of elves, dwarves, humans, demi-humans, dragonfolk, merfolk, treefolk, bluefolk, Louis Vuitton folk. Fantasy and sci-fi are full of fantastical races. But what things might you consider when world building them? Well, step into my office. We'll be splitting today's discussion into seven parts. Is realism important? Where to start? Biological pressures? Culture? The planet of hats? Universal pressures? And race and theme? And today's video is brought to you by my amazing patrons. If you would like to see more of this kind of writing and world building content, then please do consider supporting me at the link down below. And as an added bonus, one new patron who signs up this month will win a signed copy of On Writing and World Building, which has super awesome fun tips about all of this. Uh, thank you to all of you who have already gotten it. Firstly, realism. When it comes to world building, there is a lot of focus on realism, which is 100% a good thing to focus on, don't get me wrong, but it's not the most important thing when it comes to world building. Let me explain. J.R.R. Granddaddy of Fantasy Tolkien did a fantastic job world building Middle Earth, but his focus was not wholly on realism. The way Elvish evolved with six different languages branching off from a proto-language, each with numerous regional dialects, pronunciations and variations in alphabetical script due to migration and time is incredibly realistic. But at the same time, there isn't really much of a realistic reason for elves, dwarves, and humans to have developed at different heights, or for elves to be better in everything, <laughs> except maybe humility. But this isn't a criticism of Tolkien's world building, because it's part of his internally consistent mythology. The elves, dwarves, and humans were made that way by Eru and the Valar, the god and angels of sorts. And the reason that elves are better is not because they evolved under different environmental pressures, but because older things are more powerful in this world, and men didn't come into the world till ages after them. And that's just how things work, that's what Tolkien wanted. That's why super old elves are super powerful. Realism is important because it frames the unrealistic parts of your story and makes them more believable. In Story of Your Life by Ted Chiang, there is an alien species called the Heptopods, who experience time differently due to their language. And as a character learns this species language, they begin to see time differently too, past, present and future all at once. This is a scientific premise that is controversial at best, but it's what made this race of aliens so incredibly unlike anything we've seen before, and was framed by a truly realistic discussion of linguistics, politics, and biology, all of which play such integral parts of the story that we totally buy the unrealistic parts of it. And while realism does help ground your race in a familiar and believable world, sometimes the unknown is even more immersive. H.P. Lovecraft's soft sci-fi eldritch abominations from other dimensions and planes of existence and the spirits in Avatar The Last Airbender are intentionally unrealistic races of sorts, because the writers intended for them to inspire awe, horror, and wonder. These feelings make the world more immersive because the reader wants to know more, it's escapist. We don't need to be able to explain every detail of their existence. What matters is that there are internally consistent rules as to why these races are the way they are. Realism only becomes a criticism when the unrealistic parts of a story have no internally consistent justification or they don't add anything, like wonder or horror to the narrative to make it more immersive. Realism frames fantastical things and makes them more believable, and for a bad example here, consider the economic system in J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter series. Seriously, it makes no sense whatsoever, go look into it, and it doesn't really add anything to the story. So calling it unrealistic is, yeah, a valid criticism of her world building. But the ever important and impossible question looms, where should you start? A lot of world building guides start with discussing realistic approaches to how species develop scientifically, planetary forces and environmental pressures, which we'll get to soon. But the truth is, you don't really have to start anywhere in particular to do good world building. Tolkien began with an elvish language, and his elves' designs sprung out around that as the first thing he really cared about. Te Chiang began with theme, he wanted to explore free will and determinism, and wanted to create a race of aliens that experience time differently to us. But we're going to start where I feel most authors do, which is with a vague cultural idea. The high gown wearing elf, the honourable warrior race, the super advanced energy weapon aliens, the dark brooding elf, the 
bug-like hive mind race, the bow-wielding wood creatures, the, the usually short steampunk techno-geniuses of the day who usually live underground, the whiter-than-usual snow elves, the super-advanced, often near-ethereal precursor civilization, the seafaring elves- WHY THERE'S SO MANY DAMN ELVES! As generic author from the early 2000s said, there are no new stories to tell and also no more elves to create, or something like that. And these are the sort of templates that you would have seen before, once, twice, a dozen times, but a lot of writers still want to world build with them, and that's okay. A little overlap with these templates is almost inevitable, and that is fine. Even having a similar group of races to say Tolkien doesn't mean you can't be original. The Elder Scrolls has High Elves, Wood Elves, SO MANY DAMN ELVES, Orcs, Men and Dwarves, but there is so much more lore to them that is unique and original, that it does feel like a unique world. When creating races, you can go so much deeper than just a cultural template, so you can still be original. And while it's true that fantasy and sci-fi elves can be anything you want them to be. Whether starting with a cultural template, theme, abilities, or otherwise that you want to explore, those things will arise from certain biological and cultural pressures, especially if you're taking from real world cultures. They don't exist in a vacuum. So building on this, part three biological pressures, because these are the ones that authors usually focus on. In particular, three things. Feeding, reproducing, and not dying. The basic bones of any realistic species. These are going to be determined largely by the regional environmental pressures, which may include, but are not limited to, climate, predators, competition, everything changing when the Fire Nation attacks, food sources, water sources, weather, available resources, terrain, and otherwise. Consider the plucky human in its natural habitat. As plants became harder to find, humans developed the ability to eat meat, changing its bone structure and organs. Recent mating rituals also involve the male providing pointless gemstones to the female, its rarity proving its ability to provide. Humans are also very interested in not dying, even developing weapons and tools also that other things die and they don't. So you gotta figure it out. How do they get food, how do they bang, and how do they not die in their environment? In the 1974 science fiction novel Ice Rigger, the alien trans species developed claws like ice skates, enabling them to quickly move across the frozen planet to escape predators and chase prey, and larger claws usually made them more likely to mate. Breaking this down a little bit further, you might ask what grows in their climate? Who do they have to compete with for food? And what abilities do they develop to acquire the food? For example, sylvans who can telepathically persuade trees to drop their fruit are less likely to develop opposable thumbs, which they would need to create tools to cut them down. On mating, you might ask what does reproduction involve, birth, spawn, eggs, what traits would be selected for in this environment, and how long do they live? An alien race of bird-like beings that only breed in the wet season may develop colourful plumage during that season. And on not dying, you gotta ask, who are their major predators, how do they defend themselves, and how do they survive in intense weather? The Pashendi in Brandon Sanderson's Stormlight Archives developed a chitinous skin, a hard shell to protect against ferocious hurricanes that would regularly ravage the land. But more importantly, realism demands that a dominant species be dominant in an environment for a reason. This is usually a mixture of A, being able to acquire resources more efficiently than anything else, B, they become the top of the food chain, and C, they develop ways to survive natural pressures that others don't thinking flooding, intense storms, or an ice age. Humans developed tools and clothes for this, that's part of the reason we became a dominant species. But the Formix in Orson Scott Card's Ender's Game became the dominant species because they developed a hive mind, giving them the ability to seize the means, I mean, coordinate resources and people more efficiently than any other species. And this becomes a world building issue if you've got multiple sentient beings developing in the same environment. They'll be natural enemies. How did they deal with this? Absolute genocide or a symbiotic relationship of some kind, or maybe your races didn't come together till a lot later. Consider the basic biological drives. Giving a unique reason as to why a species is dominant is a fantastic world building tool to create a unique species and culture. For culture. Building on the biological pressures you have in designing your race, you've got to consider culture, which is kinda everything, including, but not limited to, We are going to go through all of these things in exorbitant HFM detail that you know and love in my new 67 part series. Okay, no. <laughs> all of these things are really important to consider, but I wouldn't be able to do them justice in this video. Keep them in mind, but we're going to focus on how biological pressures affect culture and the planet of hats. 
Firstly, it's no secret that biological pressures do affect culture. For example, it's not uncommon for resources or natural forces that are important to a way of life in a particular environment to show up in the religion. The Khajiit of elsewhere revere the moons Masa and Secunda religiously because it dictates their birth cycles and they use moon sugar in religious experiences. And while this is valuable, this line of thinking often falls into a common mistake of simplistic world building, where everything on this list is determined by those biological pressures very directly. For example, the Wraith in Stargate Atlantis seem to have no cultural traditions beyond those associated with their survival instinct to feed vampirically on other life forms. And the class system never seems to have changed in thousands of years. What about their art forms, their philosophies, how have those changed across time? Or consider elves that don't have any kind of architecture except natural tree houses because they can enchant trees and they only live in forests because that's how they first developed never coming up with the new kinds of architecture or expanding geographically despite having the ability to. These kind of species feel static, and this focus on pure biology and cultural world building is unrealistic. Gothic architecture didn't develop in response to the biological needs to mate and eat, and political structures like democracy didn't develop as a strategy to survive. It was the gradual systemic decentralization of power motivated by social movements alongside the decentralization of wealth. TLDR hashtag crown bad me vote. Do not reduce culture to the biological pressures to eat, mate, and survive. Higher order species slowly override natural selection and other more socially constructed pressures begin to guide cultural development, especially if the sentient beings can heavily modify their environment. Consider developing a number of cultural elements that either do not wholly reflect their basic biological pressures or are so far removed from them that they appear novel. And cultural evolution is a powerful force. One part of culture will influence another. Philosophies will inspire political movements, which can inspire changes in class systems, which cause changes in economic structure, which cause changes in where people live. In Ian Banks' Consider Phlebas, the ethics of criminal punishment change drastically once a post-scarcity society is established. And the establishment of these massive orbitals change how their economy works with people acquiring more land. And part of cultural evolution is diversity of thought. Not only has humanity changed as a whole across history, but multiple ideas of, say, social etiquette develop in the same place, and it varies even more geographically. Phrases like, the elves believe X, seem a little strange in this light. Allowing the reader to see a lineage of cultural evolution in a diversity of people groups means your fantasy and alien races won't feel static, as if it developed one way and unrealistically never changed. And we can't talk about constructing alien and fantasy cultures without mentioning five, the planet of hats. All dwarves are Scottish miners. All elves are punsy assholes. All orcs are very much yes sir, green, bad, not good. It's when a whole race or continent or planet is entirely defined by one character type and every individual fits into that. In David Eddings' The Belgariad series, the Cheriks are all stoic, seafaring warriors with axes and beards and braided... They're Vikings, basically. All members of the society wear the same hat. And it's obvious why these sorts of hats are unrealistic world building for your races. Large groups of people are more diverse economically, politically, socially, and morally. It's really difficult to believe that a whole world or race are this way, and that makes the world less immersive. But there's kind of a problem. It's not like cultural identity isn't a thing. Groups do share traits, that's what a culture is, especially when they grow up in the same social environment. This gives rise to stereotypes. The fact that we imagine Spartans as all warriors has some basis in their cultural history, but that doesn't make the stereotype accurate. Cultures have stereotypes, but individuals don't usually fit the stereotype completely. This is why how you represent your races in your story is perhaps the bigger question. In The Dragon Prince, the Moonshadow Elves are known as fantastic assassins, masters of illusion, wise and fearless, as well as living by a strong code of honor. Yet throughout the story we meet a number of Moonshadow Elves, all of whom fit some of this description, but never all of it. Rayla was an assassin, but she's full of fear and anxieties from the first scene. Lujan was a master of illusion, but she's not wise or knowing as Rayla expected her to be. Even Runan, the one who most closely fits the stereotype, is given a degree of complexity beyond that. 
Allowing no individual character to wholly fit a stereotype introduced beforehand gives the impression of diversity and complexity in a race, especially if the reader's first impression of them diverges from it. And the Planet of Hats often manifests with a sibling trope, equally as irritating as your own, especially if they lock you outside in the winter at eight years old after tearing your clothes off. <clears throat> I mean, world building. This is the single biome planet. Everything is desert, everything is forest, everything is ice. The logic here is that because everything is insert landscape here, all of the planet's inhabitants take on some sort of character that reflects this. In fantasy, races often only live in one environment, elves and forests, dwarves underground. Now, it's not entirely impossible that such a planet could exist. Orson Scott Card does this beautifully in Lusitania in Speaker of the Dead, so that's not unrealistic world building by itself. But, once again, Culture is more complex than the most basic environmental forces, and a species will spread geographically if they can. But six, let's not forget the usually forgotten universal pressures. These are pressures imposed on a planetary or universal scale, and as with history and religion, the most important thing you can do in world building here is study the science behind it. I'm not a scientist. I'm not going to be able to give you all the advice and information you need. In Isaac Asimov's 1941 Nightfall story, the inhabitants of Kalgash go mad. They suffer brain damage, or they even die with just a short period in absolute darkness, because their world has perpetual sunlight, given it is surrounded by six suns that's always illuminated. Maybe your planets are further or closer to the sun, maybe there is a greater gravitational pull, or it's orbiting a black hole, all of which would have drastically different physiological logical effects on the inhabitants of a planet as a group. And it should be noted here that this is usually more a consideration for science fiction, because fantasy stories tend to take place in a pseudo-Earth-like environment, even specifically European. But they don't need to. Universal pressures affect everything on the planet, so it's a good way to give an original feel to your fictional species, especially fantasy, if you really want to distinguish yourself, because they often rely on just a conventional Earth-like cosmology. And universal pressures will also affect culture. Dave Duncan's West of January features a planet that takes centuries to rotate, causing half the planet to be constantly freezing to death. Civilization does develop, but it's a permanent nomadic society, forced to migrate every few decades. And finally, let's talk about race and theme. Fantasy and science fiction have long been used to explore social issues at a distance, with alien or fantasy races often being used as a stand-in for groups in our own society, either exposing the flaws of that group, or making their concerns more palatable and allowing us to see it through a different lens. The alien prawns in Neil Blomkamp's District 9 are stand-ins for South African black people, exploring the ideas of xenophobia and racial homogeneity. Now in doing this, using alien and fantasy races to explore modern social issues often involves something called racial coding, where a species is designed with traits recognisable of a particular cultural group. This can be done well, but it can also be done badly. Really, really badly. Very lives don't matter today. Oof. You can't just slap an identical cultural label on an alien race that came from an entirely different biological and social environment. It's jarring because it doesn't make any world building sense, and if you wanted to be that explicit in the first place, then you might as well write them for who they actually are instead of aliens. Using the distance that fantasy and alien races provide thematically is often most effective when the species faces similar issues, but is not identical. Parallels can be drawn philosophically without them being parallels in world building. And it can also lead to some clumsy thematic readings. I'm going to link Lindsay Ellis' video on Bright and how this leads to really lazy world building below because she explains one perspective on it better and yeah. In summary, one, it is more important for world building to be internally consistent than realistic, realism frames the unrealistic parts to make them more believable, and the reader does not need to understand everything. Wonder and horror can be more immersive. Two, start with whatever you care about, setting, cultural template, language, theme, or otherwise, and work outwards to build a logical world from there. Just keep in mind that these things arise from particular environmental, cultural, and universal pressures. Three, biological pressures are determined by their regional environment. How does their physiology help them eat, bang, and stay alive? 
consider giving them a unique reason to be the dominant species. This is often to do with superior resource collection, being at the top of the food chain, or adapting to survive where others can't. Four, biological pressures do affect culture, but they are not the end of culture. Sentient species slowly override natural selection, especially if they're able to modify their environment, and cultural elements will evolve over time. Allowing the reader to see how they've changed and diversified prevents a static and unrealistic race. 5. The planet of hats can be avoided by ensuring that characters representing a race never fully embody the stereotype, especially if they're the first one the reader encounters. 6. Universal pressures are a simple way to give all of your races an original starting point, especially in fantasy which tends to rely on pseudo-Earth-like environments. Universal pressures can also affect culture. And 7. Fantasy and alien races are used to explore modern social issues by coding the species to represent a particular group in society. This is often unconvincing and can be heavy handed. Consider having the race face similar issues without it being identical. But what do you think? What are your alien or fantasy races like? Let me know down in the comments below. As always, links to my book and to my Patreon down there as well. But in the meantime, I hope you enjoyed this video. It was a hell of a one to put together. Just the script. Mm. Anyways, stay nerdy, and I will see you in the future.